Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oscar Wilde said, Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. Another quote, and, and several people claim this one as their own, it says this, I asked God for a bike, but I know God doesn't work that way, so I stole a bike and I asked for forgiveness. Now, in an odd way, maybe there's a little bit of truth to these, but it's not the advice that I would give you. The best advice, of course, comes from the Word of God, and that's where we're going to look tonight. Tonight we, we talk about forgiveness as we study the fifth petition and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So first, let's talk about the definition definition of the word trespass. Some translations say debt and debtors, some say sin and sinners, but they all mean the same thing in this context. To trespass means to step over a line, right? And a debt is something that we owe. So in this prayer, they all mean sin. So what exactly is a sin? Well, when I ask my 3K and 4K kids what a sin is, they say it's being naughty. And indeed, they're correct. A sin is an act against the law of God. Now, a sin can be something wrong that we do. This is called a sin of commission. We commit the sin. But a sin can also be something that we didn't do that we should have done. If someone falls on the sidewalk and you walk right past, you should have helped them. If you don't, you sin. This is called a sin of omission. Now, all sins, whether they are sins of commission or omission, evoke God's righteous wrath and deserve his punishment. And trust me, you do not want to feel the wrath of God. We don't want his punishment, so we ask for forgiveness or, or pardon from his wrath, the wrath which we deserve. And this is what the fifth petition asks for. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive our sins as we forgive others. You know, we sin every day, many, many, many times a day. In fact, most of the time, we don't even know that we're sinning. We don't know the sin that we're committing. It's born in us, right? We're, we're conceived in sin. We know this. Because of the first sin of Adam and Eve, we are naturally sinful. We are naturally enemies of God. This is what we call original sin. But we also sin because of direct temptations from the devil and his army. And we also sin from the influences of this sinful world. Just turn on the TV and you'll see that. Two weeks ago I talked about this and we referred to this as the unholy trinity, the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. So take a look at the Ten Commandments to get an idea of how you sin, how often you sin, when you sin, where you sin. Now, we don't have time to go through all of them tonight, but I am going to discuss a couple of them, and I guarantee you'll get the idea. So the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. Now, you may say, well, I believe in the one triune God. I, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I don't have a golden calf in my backyard that I worship. That's good. Those things are good. In fact, that's the kind of faith you need in order to be saved, and we'll come back to that. But that doesn't mean that you never break the first commandment. So we're going to pick it apart a little bit. Anytime, if, if even for a second, you put something ahead of God or you turn to something else instead of God, you're breaking the first commandment. For example, if you turn to anger, or spitefulness instead of forgiveness, you're breaking the first commandment. If you turn to an addiction or, or some bad habit for comfort instead of turning to God for that, you're breaking the first commandment. When you turn to worrying instead of trusting in God, parents, you're breaking the first commandment. When you put sleep or sports, or you can fill in the blank with whatever you want, ahead of God, ahead of worship, you're breaking the first commandment. 
because to have no other gods means that we trust in the one true God completely. So do you grumble or complain any time you feel the least little bit of trouble or hardship or you don't get your way? Not to mention the big stuff. You're breaking the first commandment. I, I think you get the idea. Now I'd like to look at one more. We'll look at the eighth commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor or as many of you have learned it, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. One word here is gossip. Anytime you say anything to damage another person's reputation or to make them look bad or to put them down in any way to lift yourself up a little bit, you're breaking the Eighth Commandment. Anytime you don't defend someone when someone else is talking bad about them, you break the Eighth Commandment. Do you ever lie? Do you ever stretch the truth? Even a little white lie? Do you exaggerate? Have you made peace with everyone you have ever wronged? Do you brag about yourself? Do you keep confidential the things that should be kept confidential and not go off and tell your best friend because you know they're going to love that story? You're breaking the Eighth Commandment. And let's face it, every time you sin any sin, you're damaging God's name and you're breaking the Eighth Commandment. And I'm just scratching the surface here of just two of the commandments and you can already see how, how short we fall in trying to keep them. Now in my classes for new members in adult confirmation, we go through the Ten Commandments. We go through all of them, and we break them down even further in, in complete detail. We talk about them for the whole class. And at the end of one class, a young lady raises her hand, and she looks at me, and she says, well, now I feel like garbage. Only she didn't use the word garbage, I would imagine she broke the second commandment that time. So she says, I feel like garbage. And I said, good. Now let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done for you. And really, that's one of the main reasons for the law, for the Ten Commandments. Not because we, we can keep them to earn our salvation, but actually the opposite, to show us that we can't keep them, that we need a Savior. Romans 6.23 says, Give us, it gives us a great summary. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what we pray for. We repent. We pray for the sin to be forgiven, to be forgotten. And indeed it is through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection, which, which we move closer to during this Lenten season. So now I'd like to look at one of the most popular questions that is asked when we're talking about the fifth petition. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the question is, if, if I don't forgive someone, am I forgiven? This is kind of like faith without works is, is dead, so we need to be cautious here. Because to say that we aren't forgiven unless we forgive someone else puts the burden on us. It turns this into a works righteousness, a works salvation, which of course it isn't because we are saved by grace through faith. We know this from Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So what does it mean? as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, what comes first? What comes first is what God has done for us. God created everything good, and when he created us, it was very good. And then humanity fell into sin, the original sin that we talked about earlier. We can't help but sin, and we deserve nothing but punishment. It is in our fallen nature. So we ask God to forgive us, and indeed he has. Through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You see, we're not worthy of any of this. We don't deserve anything that we pray for, and this includes forgiveness. So we need God, and we ask God to freely give us what we need. 
We need the gift of forgiveness by his grace and mercy. And it all goes together because it's only through his forgiveness that we're even able to pray at all or that we're able to forgive at all. Luther writes about this in the large catechism. He says, where the heart is not right with God, it will never dare to pray. A confident and joyful heart can only come from the knowledge that our sins are forgiven. You see, you can't forgive others until you are forgiven. That is why our forgiveness is not dependent on us forgiving other people. It can't go in that order. This prayer puts it in the right order. Forgive us our trespasses. And now that we have things in the right order, we can say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our Heavenly Father wants you to forgive and to do good to those who sin against you. Matthew 18 tells us this. Peter comes to Jesus and he asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now this is sometimes easier said than done, especially when it's a very harmful or damaging sin that was committed against us. And we certainly don't have the ability to forget even when we do forgive. God knows this. He knows that we need healing too. So we pray even more for his healing. There's a quote from Pastor Mark Jeske that I think will help us to understand the fifth petition. He says, The fuel that our hearts need to let go of hurt and danger comes from Christ. How great are our sins against him. How great is his gospel love for us that that he chose to forgive us even before we were born. How patient is his love to keep forgiving us even though we often repeat the same sins over and over. The more we are conscious of Christ's forgiveness towards us, the kinder we can be toward those who sin against us. Truly God has given you everything you need. God has indeed forgiven all sins because Jesus took them and their penalty upon himself in his crucifixion and death. The purpose of this prayer is that you may recognize and receive such forgiveness. I'll close with Romans 5.8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.